Since winning their independence and ratifying their constitution, the United States of America began expanding across North America through purchase, conquest, forced migration and genocide, bringing in new territories to the Union. Since its colonial times, America saw a huge trade in slaves from Africa as these people were bought and sold as property. After independence, the states in the North looked against slavery, many believing it to be contradictory to the ideals of a republic. The importing of slaves to the US was prohibited in 1808, but the internal slave trade in the southern states continued strongly. With the invention of the cotton gin used for quickly and easily processing cotton, the cotton industry took off in the south, fueled by slave labor. The northern states had become more industrialized and people worked on a basis of free labor, being paid to work by an employer. The southern states hadn't industrialized, relying on agriculture, the slave trade and the cotton industry for the economy. The presidential election of 1860 saw the rise of the new Republican Party candidate, Abraham Lincoln, who proposed banning slavery in all the American territories to stop it spreading. People in the South saw this as a move towards the eventual abolition of slavery in all of the states. After Lincoln's election, the southern states were ready to leave. There were attempts to compromise on slavery, but they were rejected, and thus seven of the southern states declared their secession from the United States and became the Confederate States of America, with its capital in Montgomery, Alabama. The North, and indeed Unionists in the South, saw this as illegal, believing the Founding Fathers establishing a perpetual Union. Along with a conflict of ideology towards slavery, there was also strong nationalism between the Northern and Southern states, the South worrying they would become proverbial slaves to the Industrial North. James Buchanan, who was still president at this point, didn't want to aggravate the South and start a war, but Confederacy forces began to capture Federal forces in their territories. Lincoln was sworn in as president on March 4, 1861, and he insisted on the Perpetual Union, and any secession was legally void. He wasn't going to enforce Federal law where it wasn't wanted, but he would use force to maintain Federal property. The Confederacy offered to pay for the property, but Lincoln wouldn't treat with them as it would give some recognition to the Confederate government. Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, ordered the surrender of Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, but negotiations didn't work. Confederate forces bombarded Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861, which sparked the beginning of the Civil War. This attack rang across the northern states, rallying them together against the Confederacy, believing it to be a minority of secessionists in the South, though that was not the case. Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to fight. He began ordering more and more troops south to recapture the federal buildings which were falling to the Confederacy. U.S. war veteran and military leader Robert E. Lee was offered command of the Union Army, but he declined, refusing to fight against his native state, Virginia, as its sympathies lay with the Confederacy. Refusing to send troops against their neighbors, slave states Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas actually joined the Confederacy, with the capital getting moved to Richmond, Virginia. Some Native American tribes in the Indian Territory sided with the Confederacy, becoming their allies, hoping for support from the Confederacy. That paid off. <clears throat> Other border states, Maryland, Kentucky, Delaware, and Missouri, were slave states but were against both the South's secession and fighting against the South, so they tried to remain neutral. As Union soldiers from the North moved towards Maryland, anti-Lincoln protesters rioted. Lincoln declared martial law in Maryland and Union naysayers were imprisoned, otherwise Washington, D.C. could be surrounded by Confederate states. Feeling forgotten by the Union, the Arizona Territory seceded and later joined the Confederacy. As more states left the Union, U.S. Congress stated that the war was to preserve the Union, not to end slavery. Some slaves began fleeing their owners to reach the northern states, but when they got there, they were held as wartime contraband and put to work for the Union. General Winfield Scott came up with the Anaconda Plan to block blockade the South and weaken the Confederacy without bloodshed, but people demanded Richmond be taken back. The odds were very much on the Union side, as it had the greater population. Just under half of the Confederacy's population were slaves, and the slave owners weren't going to arm them anytime soon. In July 1861, the Union Army began to advance into Virginia, but met Confederacy forces at Bull Run near Manassas, in the first major battle of the war. Although initially successful, the Union forces were stopped by General Thomas Jackson, who gained the nickname Stonewall Jackson, because of his stern defense. The famous rebel yell of the Confederate Army drove the Union back to Washington. George McClellan would become general in chief to whip the Union Army into shape. This war was not going to be as short as expected. This war was the first fully industrial war where railways, telegrams, armoured ships and improved weapons came into play. The cotton industry in the South was being crippled by the Union's blockade. The Confederacy forces hoped that the countries of Europe would step in, supporting the South, being avid customers of slave-made cotton, but Europe found its cotton elsewhere and let the Americans sort out their differences. The British, although, developed small blockade runners to continue trading for cheap cotton from the South, which just about kept the South's economy going for a little while. With the absence of the Southerners from the U.S. Senate, the House Republicans were able to bring many bills previously blocked by Southerners, including income tax, which would help fund the war. Kentucky ended its neutrality in favor of the Union when it was invaded by Leonidas Park's Confederacy forces. At the end of 1861, splinter governments of Missouri and Kentucky joined the Confederacy, but held little sway in those states.
In 1862, the Union forces chose to move in on multiple fronts through Virginia, Kentucky, and up the Mississippi. In Missouri, Confederacy forces were driven out early. Ulysses S. Grant pushed through Kentucky, capturing Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, opening up the Tennessee River. Accepting only unconditional surrender from the Confederates, he became known as Unconditional Surrender Grant and was a hero to the Union. The blockaded Confederacy knew they couldn't match the Union's fleet, so they developed ships with iron hulls and began converting their smaller fleet into ironclads. When the CSS Virginia went up against the wooden Union fleet, it decimated them. But the following day, the Union's first ironclad, the USS Monitor, arrived and the Battle of the Ironclads was fought to a draw, but it revolutionized naval warfare forever. Wooden warships were now redundant. In April, as the Union moved further into Tennessee, the Confederacy led a surprise attack in Shiloh, pushing Union forces to the river. But as the Union Navy arrived, Grant's forces mounted a counterattack and won a bloody battle and decisive victory against the Confederacy. Meanwhile, in Northern Virginia, Union forces under George McClellan had been moving very slowly towards Richmond. They were ultimately forced to retreat after the Seven Days Battle by General Robert E. Lee's superiorly numbered forces. Union forces under John Pope tried to push south again and failed again. Confident after their victories, Confederacy forces invaded the north, General Lee pushing into Maryland on September 5th. Two weeks later, Lee's forces met McClellan's at the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest single day in United States history, ending in Confederacy retreat. In December, new Major General Ambrose Burnside once again pushed for Richmond, but was heavily defeated by Lee at Fredericksburg. Frederick Douglass, a former slave and well-travelled social reformer, had been campaigning for the abolition of slavery, that that's what this war was truly about. In January 1863, Lincoln brought about the Emancipation Proclamation, an executive order that led to the freeing of three million slaves in the Confederate States. Many African Americans joined the Union Army to fight against slavery. The Union went through a few different generals in the East, unable to defeat General Lee's forces. Despite being outnumbered two to one, Lee was victorious at Chancellorsville, although he did lose Stonewall Jackson to friendly fire. West Virginia separated from Virginia and became neutral. As General Lee made another push into the north, Major General George Meade took charge of the Union forces and they fought for three days in July at the Battle of Gettysburg, the bloodiest battle of the war with huge losses on both sides. Lee retreated, but Meade was not able to capture their forces. This battle was the turning point of the war as the Confederacy threat was never as great. The draft laws in the north weren't popular and riots broke out in New York. Many got into this war for ideological reasons, some for the adventure or simply to defend their home, but the horrors of war changed many of their minds. In the West, Grant captured Vicksburg, the last Confederacy stronghold on the Mississippi. The Union now had complete control over the Great River and effectively split Confederacy forces in two. Texas was cut off from the Confederacy, but under General Kirby Smith, they managed to hold up strong defences and a self-sufficient economy. In November, Lincoln spoke at Gettysburg and recalled back to the foundation of the United States, how all all men are created equal and how this nation shall have a new birth of freedom. Grant relieved besieged Union forces at Chattanooga, pushing Confederacy forces out of Tennessee, leaving Union forces looking at the heartland of the Confederacy. With the start of 1864, Grant was made commander of all Union armies by Lincoln. They decided upon a huge coordinated campaign pushing into the Confederacy from all directions. Grant pushed his forces down through Virginia towards the Confederacy capital, Richmond, fighting Lee's army along the way, both sides suffering heavily. It was a war of attrition. Despite setbacks for the Union, Grant pushed on, driving Lee to Richmond and close by Petersburg. Lee moved to defend Petersburg as it was the railway supply line for the capital. Grant dug trenches and a ten-month siege ensued. Meanwhile, Union forces under William Tecumseh Sherman moved from Chattanooga and captured Atlanta, Georgia in September 1864. Other Union forces swept along the Shenandoah Valley, fighting the other the remaining Confederate army, ultimately defeating them. That November, Abraham Lincoln was re-elected president, defeating Democrat candidate George McClellan. Sherman marched his army through Georgia towards Savannah, destroying industry, infrastructure and civilian property along the way, the march to the sea. Sherman captured Savannah on December 21st and offered it as a Christmas present to the newly elected Lincoln. The Confederate Army of Tennessee was also defeated in Nashville. Only the army in North Carolina and Lee's besieged army in Petersburg were all that remained to fight for the Confederacy. At the start of 1865, the 13th Amendment to the the U.S. Constitution to abolish slavery was approved by the U.S. Congress. Change was happening. With advancing Union reinforcements, Lee ultimately evacuated Petersburg and Richmond. Union forces secured the city. Outnumbered and outgunned, General Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. Grant would not arrest the Confederate Army and they could keep their sidearms and horses. News of the surrender spread and celebrations erupted in Washington. On April 14th, the Stars and Stripes was raised over Fort Sumter where it all began. That evening, Abraham Lincoln went to a play with his wife in Ford's Theatre. There, he was shot by John Wilkes Booth and later died. Vice President Andrew Johnson became president. 
Throughout May, the remainder of the Confederacy forces surrendered and the Civil War ended. The states of America were united once more. Over 700,000 people died in this war, the deadliest war in American history. In December 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified and slavery was officially abolished. Grant would become president in 1869. Life would go on. The United States endured, although divisions remained in the minds of many. Racism didn't end with slavery. The Republican Party abandoned civil rights for African Americans in favor of big business. The 20th century saw black communities segregated from white communities, especially in the Deep South. It wouldn't be until the 1950s and 60s that many people stood together to demand equal rights for people of color. Today, racism is still an element in the lives of many, sometimes bubbling below the surface, sometimes not so much. The Civil War still lingers in the mind of many Americans and acts as a reminder of how far people can go when faced with giving up what they see as their God-given right, even when it is to the detriment of the lives of others. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. I forever appreciate your patience, as these videos are very work-intensive and take a lot of time to do. If you want to support the making of more videos, you can do so through Patreon. The bigger the carrot, the quicker this donkey will go. By being a patron, you can get exclusive previews of artwork while I work on them. Keep up to date with my work through Facebook, Twitter and now Instagram. I'm still working that one out. My channel has recently hit 80,000 subscribers and I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank you all for the support and enthusiasm. I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon. I know the wait for a new video can be a while, but be assured I have not and probably will not abandon this channel and am probably quietly working on the next video as we speak. Your suggestions are always welcome and eventually heeded. Thank you so much. Please share. The more we know about history, the more we can apply to today.